October 6, 1998. I'm at uh, Royer Insurance here in Dixon, uh, speaking to Dell Hawley. Uh, my name is Paul Farrell. And uh, we should begin with some family history. Um, you have some interesting family history, the Hawley family and the Royer family. Well, where do you want to begin? <laughs> How far back do you know? Do you know anything about the great-grandparents? The I know the um, I don't know the great grandparents on the Holly side. I know of the great grandparents on the Royer side. Mm -hmm. um, my great grandmother was uh, Lena Royer, and um, I don't remember my great grandfather at all. He passed away before I have any memory of him. My Great grandmother just lived on the east side of Dixon, and uh, the Royer ground butted up against the east boundary of of town. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember her as being quite elderly, but an extremely sharp uh, lady. My uh, my grandfather oversaw the farming. Uh, was leased out to others to do the farming. But I can remember my great-grandmother calling him and uh, almost uh, getting the yields down on the wheat and uh, just from her observation. And she, uh, she kept, behind the house was a barn, and she kept cows in there and milked them. Uh, up until she could hardly walk, I think. So I remember, remember that. I remember when uh, when I was in high school, we for the senior prom there was still a uh, carriage in the barn, and she allowed us to bring it out and uh, clean it all up and paint it all up, and we used that as a centerpiece of our. It was a senior to junior prom. You, you brought the carriage? Brought it into the uh, uh, hall where we were having our dance, and we used that as a decoration centerpiece uh, hmm. for it. It was still in, in good shape. It's it, still in good shape? It was at that point. I don't know where it is now. Oh. Uh, that, uh, I wish there was a Dixon Museum. We could put yeah, it that would have been. There uh, will be been, some. I, yeah, I assume so. Um, my grandfather and his uh, brothers were very active in, uh, uh, they were quite good baseball players. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, my uncle Ray went on and played in the major leagues for Pittsburgh and then played in the Pacific Coast League and actually led the Pacific Coast League in hitting and home runs uh, for a number of years. Uh, I remember him talking about, uh, he, he lost, he got out of baseball when um, his eyesight started to go, but one of the things that, that accelerated him getting out of baseball, he was quite a very good hitter and uh, in those days, it was not uncommon to throw the ball right at the, the lead batters. You know, the, and, uh, now so that didn't affect. Did he get hit in the head? And hurt no, his it just it just took his. That you know, I mean, this is getting to be ridiculous. I, you know, I better, better. Uh, I've got a family to support and things like that. Thing, so I'm better. Uh, Rougher sport. Do man. something yeah. else. Uh, type of thing. But they, they had a town league here, uh, baseball, that was quite good. I believe it was called the Golden Poppies, which was a flour mill in town. And they used to get on the train and go up the valley and down the valley and play different uh, teams. I, I've heard about that. I think there were four Royers on uh, the Let's see. There was uh, Eggert, Hans. Claude, uh, Ray, Jake, and uh, six. 
six? Six. On the team? Yeah, six brothers. At different in times. Iowa. I don't oh, know. at different times. Yeah, That's I know. Because right. uh -huh. Otto was younger, and I don't know if he played with them or not, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think uh, Otto came after the daughters were born. Yeah, I think so. So I don't think he played. I understand Jake uh, died very young. Uh, uh, Claude did. Claude. He Claude died. and Jake. Jake died relatively young, too. But died Claude. on a baseball field. I believe so. Yeah. Um, Claude was an attorney. He coached the high school, too, also, here. Um, Ager, I remember Ager worked for the meat, uh, Mace Meat, the CB Mace Meat, and um, they tell a story about him. Uh, she used to have the multi-key calculators, the ones with all the keys, mm -hmm. and whenever a salesman would come in to sell Mace Meat, one of these, uh, CB Mace said, well, if you can, if it's quicker than Agar, then I'll buy it. And my uncle had a knack of going down an invoice of uh, meat, meat carcasses, and looking at the pounds and looking at the price per pound and come up with a bottom line figure. And he was actually quicker than the calculator, the way he, uh, the method he used. And I think he just rounded, rounded things to the tenth and subtracted. Uh, that's kind of how he, he did it. Quite, quite unique that way. Um, Ray, my uncle, uh, my grandfather, once he came back from Canada, he started, he had a hardware store right downtown. That was Hans. That was Hans. Hans, I should right. say. And he, the hardware store, and he was also the case uh, tractor dealer for a while. But, you know, kind of what you did. Um, the downtown was maybe three blocks long. Um, and then at 46, Daddy Hans, that's what we call him, and um, he bought uh, R.L. Stevens Insurance Agency and then switched over. And he was also a grain buyer. Grain, he bought grain for different um, companies. Um, the one I remember he put for um, Cargill was one I remember. And he also bought uh, wool for a company in Massachusetts. And that's, uh, I can remember um, when I was in high school how I earned money at work for my grandfather sampling grain in the summer. Um, there was, the grain was still, was harvested, um, you know, and a lot of it was stacked in the field in bulk or it was put into sacks and then the sacks were hauled into warehouses uh, and I, used to have to go out and sample whenever a grower would go into a new field, you would sample the grain, test it, see the quality of it, keep a small jar of sample, and then send a sack about, oh, about uh, six to eight inches uh, tall and probably four inches in diameter, and then that was sent off to the grain company. So when the farmer was ready to sell, uh, my grandfather could look at the sample we had, called the grain buyer, and he could look at the sample he had, and they would uh, come up with what they were going to offer the farmer for, for his grain. Um, and there was, we had, a, this was when basically Dixon was still had um, dry land farming was the majority. So we raised the barley and wheat and oats around here. 
And there was, at that, when I was in high school, there were probably I think about 12 different warehouses within 25 mile radius of here that the farmers stored there. I spoke right to uh, May Azevedo, the uh, wife mm -hmm. of Joe Azevedo. He was in that, that business of storing grain. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so it was, you know, there was always plenty of work with growing up around here. There was always some place you could find a job either with one of the farmers or that, which kept you pretty busy. Um, what kind of farm work did you do? You mentioned, of course, the sampling of the grain. Did, did, were you involved in harvesting it? Uh, I, I wasn't uh, involved in, in the harvesting. Um, my dad, um, he worked for Sheldon Oil for a number of years, and then uh, he, uh, in 49, we moved into moved from Susun, where Sheldon Oil was, up here. And uh, Dad farmed some of the Holly property south of town. And so at that point, Dad drove tractor and irrigated and, you know, did whatever had to be done um, while we were farming. And the Holly property, we had 160 acres and then farmed another David Holly piece of 40, 40 acres, and then we had some other ground. That was all? And that was Holly property. It was dry farming grain? Uh, no, it was all row crop. It was all row crop? Row crop, about that time. Now, yeah. what about that bit of history I'm not clear on? Now, the irrigation happened, and then the row crop came in, is that right? The there were still some, there was some row crop around here prior to Berryessa coming in. And that was, that was all done by Wells. By Wells. By Wells. Uh -huh. um, and it was our. I think our our wells were drawn up. Our the bowls were down about 800 feet. But we were drawing water up pretty good. And you've got you were having to use a hundred horsepower electric motor, which is now would be very expensive. You know, electricity is pretty expensive now. Mm -hmm. um, but we just didn't have enough ground uh, or the capital to support some of the. We got caught with tomatoes, uh, couldn't get them harvested because of rain and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, in essence, we, my dad stopped farming and went back working and uh, went to work for Aston Construction down in Rio Vista. What they did is they put in. Uh, well sites and things of that nature were mainly, mainly what they did, and then we leased the ground, the ground down. Yeah, I've talked to uh, a lot of people involved in farming, and a couple of, I guess, sayings I keep hearing. One is, farming is, is a real gamble, and another is, a farmer never has a day off, they're always working. Mm -hmm. You really don't, or you, you're always thinking about your, and yes, it is a gamble because you're always, uh, you're, you're dealing with things you have no control over. You have no control over the weather. And so uh, you, uh, we're, we are in better shape. The farming around here is in better shape, or even then was in better shape, because we had irrigation and we could put very different crops in as compared to when it was dry land farming. When it was dry land farming, you put the crop in and then you just relied 100% on Mother Nature. Uh, hope you got it in at the right time and uh, hope the rains came at the right time and not too much um, rain. And when it got up and headed out, you hoped you didn't have a north wind that would whip it, whip the heads off. and. Uh, you know, so yeah, since kind of dry line farming, you put the seed in the ground and then you get on your knees and uh, hope uh, Mother Nature is uh, kind to you. And a lot of this ground, especially down south, it's, it's heavy ground. And the old saying on that is that you have 
one day to work that ground. The day before it's too wet, and the day after it's too hard and dry. And so, it, you know, south of town, you have the ground, the heavy ground people that farm that. A little unique, they have to know what they're doing to, to do a good job. The Holly side, I, I don't remember my grandfather Earl. He passed away before. Um, but they had, um, they had ground south of town and uh, they farmed and um, so I remember the stories about the Holly side. They liked horses and maybe sometimes put too much money in their horses and uh, that type of you mean they were raising horses as a, a business? They, no, they just liked. They just liked to have good horses. Good horses. <laughs> they just liked to have good horses. So uh, my grandmother Nellie Holly, uh, I, what I remember about her is just that just super lady, always uh, uh, never really spoke unkindly of anybody. I remember always she wore her hat and her gloves, and she went out. Let's see, uh, always dressed. My um, her mother lived in the city, and uh, she was she owned at one time owned um, a bakery in in the city, and she was quite quite good. At at baking, at baked goods and things of that nature. And then she was very protective of her, uh, of her recipe. She would not even give her daughters her recipes uh, for, for baking. My grandmother, uh, Nell, was an uh, excellent cook. We used to go over there on Sunday dinners and different holiday dinners. And, uh, what was the name of the bakery? Don't remember the name of the baker in the city. Mm -mm. And, and, you know, um, somebody that might would be my uncle uh, Don or or Bob. Both of those, both of them are in San Sacramento, and they they uh, might know. And they would give you a much better uh, of the Holly side than I can. Maybe I'll get a chance. To yeah, I spent that. most. I was very close to my uh, grandfather and my grandmother. I spent a lot of time uh, with, with them uh, when I was, uh, even when we lived in Sioux Soon, I used to come and spend the summers up here. Uh, what you can remember about Dixon, when, like when I was in elementary school. Um, Which school did you go to? Uh, well, I went through the seventh grade, uh, sixth grade at Crystal down in Sioux Soon, uh -huh. and then moved up to, when we moved to Dixon, I came in at the seventh grade. And that was over where, um, where it's called Anderson now, but that was the only elementary school in, in, in town. Hmm. Um, so what was town like when you... Down, the town at that point was about... 2,000, 2,400. Um, the edge of town would have been uh, Judge Seaver's house over on West Day. If you go down West Day, that big house on the right, on the south side of the street, mm -hmm. yeah, that was the, kind of the edge of town. Right? In fact, it was set out um, from there weren't any houses around it. And they started building those about that time it started growing. Um, excuse me. It was, we had the high school and we had the elementary school and that was about it. Um, I would say the high school probably had a couple hundred at the most. Um, the 
you knew everybody in town, everybody in town knew you, kind of a, like in most small towns, standing joke, you don't have to turn your turn signals on because everybody knows where you're going and what you're going to do anyway, type of, type of thing. It was a, it was a good place uh, to grow up. But, um, what would a little kid do for fun back then? Well, what we had, uh, we had um, good athletics in both the elementary school and at the high school. So when I was in high school, I think there was only two two boys in my whole class that didn't go out for any athletics. I mean, that's just what you did. Everybody went out for athletics. Um, you, we did hunting. We worked. You know. Um, you, in the summer, if you weren't working, you would pick up baseball games and things of that nature. Um, had the swimming pool, so there was swimming going on. And of course, uh, my, uh, my grand, uh, Daddy Hanson Grammy loved to travel, and so uh, I would go with them. They were the type of people, um, the agency were, was open uh, five and a half days, it stayed open t uh, noon on Saturdays, and then they would just take off, um, go for a ride in the car or go for the weekend, they liked to go up in the Redwoods and, and that. Um, How about the roads around here now that you're talking about traveling? Uh, some of the country roads were these dirt and gravel. Yes, yeah, we had dirt and dirt and gravel uh, roads, but the majority of the county roads uh, when I was um, growing up were were paved. You got further east and south of town, um, they were gravel, but practically everything else was 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 paved. Um, and of course, there wasn't the traffic. Uh, Dixon has always had a reputation. Highway 40 used to run right through the middle of town, come, come ran Porter Road uh, to uh, now Adams, mm -hmm. and then out North uh, North First Street um, to what's well, now called uh, to like Sievers Road. Took a 90 went east and then went out, uh, which is now Pedri, Pewter Creek, through Davis, you know, Highway 40 ran through every, every one of the small towns, you know, Vallejo, Fairfield, Vacaville, Dixon, Davis, you know, going, going to Sacramento. Um, and Dixon was always noted that you, uh, if the sign said 25, you do 25, you don't do 26. Especially if it was an out of town, it wasn't a local car. I mean, that place used to make them part of the city budget, I assume. I never heard that. So Dixon was a speed trap. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, it was a, always interesting. My grandfather was a mayor for a number of years uh, in Dixon, so hanging out around the, the agency, there was always people coming in, so that was interesting to hear them talk, especially Saturday mornings. Uh, I don't know whether my grandfather did much insurance business Saturday mornings, but most of his uh, friends would come in and just uh, sit around and talk. You know, and, Saturday mornings. Um, then they would, yeah, you know, I mean, it was a kind of where a lot of things, you had a certain group of people in town and uh, I think a lot of stuff got accomplished. They would just talk about it and it would be brought up at the city council meeting that would get get done, get, uh, get accomplished. So, yeah, yeah. 
pretty interesting perspective being the, the grandson of the mayor. And yeah, it, it's, it's good in, in a way, but also in the other aspect of it, uh, you were, you know, you were under, you were in the, kind of under the microscope a little bit too. You didn't want to, uh, if you got, you know, as most boys do, kind of stretch the, the limits every once in a while. Uh, uh, my grandfather coming uh, from a strong German background, it was, it was either most things were black and white. There weren't a lot of gray areas, and it was uh, you did it right or you did it wrong. And if you did it wrong, uh, you could expect to uh, reap the benefits of doing it wrong. <laughs> and uh, so it was uh, that that part of it was. Uh, and some other kids could get away with it. I couldn't get away with it. <laughs> uh, type of thing, but you know uh, the that kind of break the the with with the background uh, of my grandfather. His father was extremely uh, strict, very, very strict, uh, and the, it, was, it was interesting that the boys were, Egert and Hans didn't get to go to college, and my grandfather got to go to a business school. Uh, but. And I don't know, remember whether Jake did, but Ray did, Claude did, and Otto went, went to college. Um, and I think the, the strong, sometimes it was too, my great, rather, my great grandfather, from what I hear, was uh, sometimes too strict. Um, and they tell a story about um, my great grandmother. Um, well, during harvest time, of course, you fed the harvest crew because it was you had um, in the early stages. If one attended the mules, you had a header tender, you had a, a sack jigger, you had a sack sower or two, so you had a pretty, you had quite a few people on that uh, harvester. And so they would always have uh, a good sized lunch. And um, my grandmother needed something, and it was during midday, so she came into town to do shopping. And I don't know whether my great grandfather or one of the uncles, and I think it was one of the great, one of his brothers, one of the great great uncles, was playing uh, cards in town and came out uh, just to stretch midday and saw my grandmother in town, saw the buggy and the horse in town. So when he went back to the ranch, she was not. She was supposed to do shopping once a week, and that was it, and was not supposed to be in town. And he shot the horse. He shot the horse. Shot the horse. Hooked up to the buggy in town. Because she, she was wasn't not supposed, supposed to, be. to be in town. Mm. And that's like blowing up your car. Mm -hmm. you know? And that was my Grandmother did not come into town from then on in midweek. It's a week to do the shopping, and that was it. Uh, she made sure she fed the harvest crew. Yep. <laughs> and so that, uh, you know, that, uh, I think that's a little bit, 
severe, but, you know, I mean, you had the rules to live by, and then once the rules were set down, that everybody was expected to, uh, to follow those, those rules. And uh, I think the brothers coming out of that type of thing, they carried some of them. Oh, let me turn this over. Okay, I got it going. Uh, you, were, you were saying about the brothers coming out of that. I think the brothers coming, coming out of that, uh, of course, did not carry it to that extent, but they were very uh, disciplined uh, uh, people and, you know, had a very strong um, feeling of what was right and what was wrong. I, th I think that served them well. They, uh, they all uh, did, uh, I think, did well uh, in the community. Uh, Reed, uh, Eggert did well at, uh, at um, Mason, and he was a very strong Mason, went through the chairs in Masonry uh, and that. And uh, my grandfather, I think, you know, being mayor and well respected in the community. Ray was more quiet, uh, but he, and he worked for the Belief Production Land Bank, so he was in banking, that, that side of it. Um, again, Jake died at an early age, so I don't remember Jake. And Claude only from what I hear, because uh, he died at a young age. Um, and then, of course, Otto uh, went on and went to law school and became a prominent attorney in the Sacramento area. Um, and my cousin Claude, who was Claude's boy, uh, he and I were very close, or are very close. We we did a lot of things. We did a lot of. Uh, when we were going to high school, we had a lot of activities going. Uh, Claude always was raising chickens or sheep or something, or hogs, we had that going. We did the grain sampling. Uh, a lot of times we'd get up early or go late and get side jobs. Uh, we had a contract to keep the weeds out of, we get the weeds in the summer uh, around the schools one summer. Uh, there was always plenty to keep you keep you busy. Uh, now what, what, what was the graduating class there in your high school? What year was it? I graduated in 55. 55. Right, 55. Size of the class? Would you tell me it was 20-something? Yeah, I think we were in 20, 24, right in that range. Yeah. I talked with uh, Margaret... Uh, Royer Carpenter, mm -hmm. she graduated much earlier than you, but she um, she just loved the dances, the high school dances, and was there a lot of, uh, I always hear about the sports that is for students getting together, but what about dances? Yes, there were always a lot of dances. Uh, my generation wasn't as big a deal as my mother's generation. They um, had a lot of dances and did a lot uh, where they went to other high school dances. Uh, that was, I can always remember my mom and dad talking about that. That was always uh, a big, uh, um, big activity for them. Uh, it just appeared that, you know, every weekend or every other weekend there would be one of those activities. Um, that they would attend and go to. And they would talk, uh, many people talked about the dances that were not uh, high school dances, dances for benefits, benefiting the volunteer firemen, benefiting well, the groups. Anytime you're in a small town, yes, you have a lot of community activities at, which are fundraisers for different clubs or firemen. Firemen in Dixon 
was a uh, it was a volunteer fire department, but it was kind of a, a social focal point also. The firemen they would were always would put on activities and um, dances and uh, you know things of, of that nature and you know, different types of clubs and women's clubs and the, uh, you know different activities there yeah, I think uh, um, back in my mom's and dad's era a lot, a lot of church activities went on also you know Jimmy people were um, were involved that was part of the social structure uh, of the of the community uh, I've heard a lot about that from from people uh, yeah you call it the social focal point that's, right that's a, a good way of putting it it, yeah. it really is true the masons and the Mm -hmm. The women's club, the women's club, and even on a small scale, the bridge clubs. Yes, my my parents belong to a bridge club, and they I did, just talked they, to your aunt yesterday, and she yeah. was, <laughs> yeah, she had AM and PM bridge club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they uh, when we lived in Susun, they had a bridge club down there, and they even after we moved up here, they would, I, I think of it was almost once a month. That they would get to, you know, get together and um, play, play bridge, um, type of thing. The 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 Dixon Mayfair was always a big thing here. Yeah, that's that's yeah. something I wanted to talk to you about. What uh, what about your earliest memories? It's changed an awful lot. But what was it like way back when you remember the, the Mayfair? Did they call it May Day or did they call it Mayfair? I know they went through a name change. Uh, that was May Day. May Day. Mm -hmm. Well, May Day, and it was when when that time came. We just we just almost lived down at the fair uh, because of either helping out with livestock that either mainly Claude did that, and I helped him out. Like now, now he said the Holly family had some good horses. Didn't yeah, and I don't know what they used to. They talk about racing at the Mayfair. Uh, in the center of the uh, the racetrack, that's where the ball diamond was too. So they used to, you know, that they'd go down and they play baseball down there. Um, that would be my grandfather's era when when they were still playing. Uh, they did have the, the races down there. Um, I've seen photos, you know, seen photos. Uh, of that. In fact, there's a photo in the post office of a baseball game going on, and that was that's at the fair, where the fairgrounds were. Um, when I was growing up. Uh, my grandfather always had a box, and uh, you had um, the horse shows going on, different, you know, uh, pleasure horses, different uh, classes or categories that went on for most of a day. You had the sheepdog trials uh, that went on. Dixon was quite a uh, dairy and sheep raising uh, area uh, back in the, uh, you know, 20s, 30s. And, and even when I was going through, uh, when I was in high school, it was still a very strong sheep area. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, good quality um, sheep breeding stock came out of the Dixon area. Uh, the Tim Ranch was very strong in sheep raising. The Tim Peterson Ranch. Ranch. I talked with Sadie Peterson. I talked with uh, Malcolm Tim as well. Okay, yeah. right. And the Tim, just uh, northeast, that uh, Tim Dairy at one time was one of the most modern, up-to-date dairies uh, 
in, in California. Yeah, it had a real reputation. A very strong reputation. And we had, you know, in those days, the town, one of the things that differs, differs now from Dixon uh, to when my dad grew up here and when I grew up here, um, the community was more self-contained. Um, but when my dad grew up here, uh, I mean, it had a flour mill, it had several granaries, it had a couple of slaughterhouses, uh, you had a brewery, um, you had uh, equipment dealers, uh, you had several hardware stores. You, you know, you had the down. Uh, the soda funds, the show. I mean, you didn't have to go anyplace because it was, it was here. Um, and even when I was growing up, we didn't have a flour mill or, or, um, or a brewery, but we had auto dealers. We had, uh, we had Chrysler, Chevy, Ford. International. So we had four auto dealers. We had and farm equipment dealers. We had four farm equipment dealers. I talked about Rossi. Yeah, yeah, because and um, we had a show. We don't have. We have one auto dealer now. We have one equipment dealer. Uh, you know, we don't have a show. With all that, with the transportation, you know, uh, we're. What about a, uh, well, the people, uh, I guess I should say, the ethnic groups, you know, they talk about the Portuguese, the Germans, really the big two there. Portuguese tended towards dairy and Germans Correct. tended towards dry farming. Exactly. Yeah. That, uh, that, that was true uh, when you were growing up. Right. Yeah, the most, there was, uh, like our, our family came basically from Schleswig-Holstein and from that area they seemed to come into either Dixon area or Glen County, our toys up that way. In fact, our toys used to be called Germantown. Oh, and so there was a lot of uh, back and forth between Glen County and, um, and the Dixon area. Um, and a lot of these, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the Royer family tree where it starts with the Johns, I mean, there's a lot, you've got uh, the Johns and the Agerts and the Rungies and the Royers and the Schroeders and um, the, you know, there's a, if, you, if you read down a family tree, boy, it's really easy to get confused because, I mean, there's, you know, there's some Johns marrying Johns and some Eggerts marrying Eggerts and, you know, their one brother's wife would, or one brother would die and maybe another, and, you know, they, maybe if one brother's wife would die and so the left, the, the brother would marry the other brother's wife, widow. You know, there was those types of, uh, uh, of marriages uh, going on. Um, it was kind of, I don't know, I heard a story you know, just the other day. Uh, one of my uncles, and this was in the 20s, um, I don't know if he was just good friends or didn't work for a gentleman that had property on lakefront property on the south shore of Tahoe. And the gentleman got a hold of my uncle and he wanted to go up and look at his property. So my uncle, they, they drove up. This was the 20s. It took him correctly all day. 
And I don't know whether it was the guy was just nice or whether he, my uncle had done some work for him and it was a, maybe a form of payment. But he said, oh, you can pick any of these waterfront lots that you want up here at Tahoe. And my uncle said, no, 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 it takes too long to get up here. This is never going to go. You know, this is too remote, too far out of the way. <laughs> Yeah. I'm surprised to hear that. I yeah. thought he had such good business sense. <laughs> I would have thought that was surprised to hear that too. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, what about, uh, well, let's jump from Germans to Portuguese. Now, the Portuguese had a parade as well. Yes, uh, that was uh, Portuguese Festa, and it was very connected with the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. They would uh, choose a queen had a parade uh, down Main Street, um, similar to now the, uh, the Mayfair parade, but, uh, and then they would have um, a, a big dinner afterwards where they, they served what's called soupish. And great, just great stuff. It's beef, oiled beef over the bread, and, there's mint in it, it doesn't sound good, but it is great stuff. And all the small towns used to do that around here. Um, that was, and they always had a dance at night. And so everybody would go, go to the dance and uh, on Sunday go to church and then they would have, and I don't remember whether the parade was on Sunday or after church or on uh, Saturday, but then they would have the, uh, the feed afterwards, and that was always uh, interesting. We, I mean, and when I was in high school, we used to go to those things all the time. We just, Dick would have one, Rivesta would have one, Ailton would have one, Galt would have one. All Portuguese? Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. And you just kind of went, because you always saw, would see guys that you, Played against in sports and such there. And, so, uh, and you get some good food. Oh, great food. Super food. Yeah. And uh, it, it, uh, it was a, a, a lot of fun. The You know, Greg, I would say one of the advantages growing up in a town like Dixon, then is that you got you, you could, you got a chance to do a lot of things, a lot of different things. Uh, if you were in a metropolitan area, you probably didn't have the opportunity to do the different things that we did in high school. You know, different because I mean, you could do your academic type stuff, but then they had a very strong ag department also. Hands-on type thing. Uh, growing up in a small community, uh, unless you had a chance to to play multiple sports, you, that's just what you did. You played the basketball, and the football, and the baseball, and ran the track, and you know, so and did the tennis. And we're in a metropolitan area because of all the competition. Unless you were very good at it, you wouldn't have the chance to do that. Yeah, it's uh, impressive what you what you said. The high school class, only two boys did not play sports. Right. It's amazing. And everybody else, but I mean you were good, but everybody <laughs> everybody got a chance to play because there weren't a lot a, a lot uh, a lot of you. Hmm. Um, so it was my my dad talks about when he was in high school playing at the different, uh, uh, you know, different towns around here. And some of their, when they, they played basketball, there was one place they played basketball which was on up in the second floor of the building. And so the ceiling was quite low. So, I mean, you did mainly layups there, taking a long shot. 
<laughs> was, was almost impossible to do. Maybe you could do a bank shot. Yeah, right. <laughs> type, type of thing. Uh, you know, and even when I was in high school, we, we played towns like um, Esparto and Winters and uh, Clarksburg, Cortland. Um, I don't even know whether Cortland had, I don't think Cortland had a high school now. Even, and I don't know whether Clarksburg does have a high school now. Those were all towns that, that we played in. We played into some gyms that were pretty tiny. I mean, you go in for a layup, you hope that the door was open. <laughs> you smack up against, uh, against the wall uh, type of thing. I, I would say that that was the advantage of growing up in Dixon. Um, was it? Uh, you you had uh, you had a, had a chance to have a pretty rounded experience. Um, I was just going to ask you, uh, well, what do you like about growing up in Dixon? Which just answered that. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good that, description yeah. of what it was like. Town. Right. Now you uh, you didn't move away. I mean, you, well, I mean, you're still here today. I'm still here today. I I did. As soon as I graduated from high school, I went down to San Jose, went to school down there, and worked down there, uh, and I worked for a company that was sold, and went to work for the parent company back in o in Ohio, and so I lived back there for about eight years and then came back here in 65 and that's when I uh, came in my grandfather's agency. Um, it wasn't a hard sell. I, he called up one time uh, and it was snowing and blowing back in Cincinnati and uh, being, being raised in California, born and raised in California. Um, it's great to travel and see other sections, but there are very few areas that uh, are like California, where you have such a variety. Uh, and this area is excellent for that. Uh, two hours you're into the high Sierras, an hour and a half you can be over to the, two hours over to the coast, an hour, hour and a half you're into a very metropolitan San Francisco. Uh, if you want to stretch it three to hours or so, you're into the, you can be in the desert. There's very few sections of uh, of the of the United States that you can do that. I mean, there might be other countries where that can be done. I've not traveled that, but I've traveled uh, quite a bit throughout the United States, and there are very few that you have that variety. Yeah, this is a. Uh it's a wonderful place. Um, you know, something else, uh, I was telling you, things I keep hearing, uh, that, you know, about farming. The one thing I keep hearing, which is kind of disturbing, is all this good soil for growing is, is getting paved over. Yes, it is, but as you still know, we still grow surpluses. There's still a lot of open ground, and it's pretty hard to tell somebody that, especially if they're having financial problems, that they can't sell their ground. Um, so it's, you know, it's a two edge farming. Farmers, as a whole, are survivors. They're probably one of the few people or occupations that are, the people that do it are very strong individualists. If, in fact, agriculture ever got together, let's say like unions did, where they controlled the growing of it 
the if they controlled it to the market, um, our prices wouldn't be what they are now. I think we would just have a, a very strong economic influence and a very strong political influence. Uh, so, in a way, you know, our, our farmers out here do not enjoy the same political clout that the European farmer enjoys. Mm -hmm. European farmer has a very strong uh, political clout, consequently an economical clout. Just yesterday I heard some interesting news about the French farmers and how they control things. Mm -hmm. We better not talk about it. We have to talk about Dixon. That's <laughs> right. So, so, uh, so now, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm you sorry. know, so the, the, the farming, I, I think that's always, that's Another advantage growing up in Dixon, because you you see a lot of hard work, a um, lot of good role models, a guy, people that are successful, and their success. And you're watching agriculture; they're successful because they know what they're doing. They tend to tend to it, they work hard at it, um, and whatever they get, in most cases, it's not a windfall, it doesn't come easy. You don't have a, um, I think you have a more solid perspective of what it takes to succeed. You're not, if you, if you do it right and you watch carefully, um, you see, you don't see, you don't expect things to come in a windfall, you know, instantaneous. It just, you, you grow up thinking, okay, I've got to, you know, build the foundation and then I'll get the rewards. I mean, if something falls into place and the windfall in, in the meantime, then, uh, then maybe I'm ahead of the game. And so you're not always looking for that rainbow, that quick fix. And when it does come and you get lucky, you, you're conservative and careful. Yeah. It. It's farming, uh, a small town too, kind of, I don't know, builds character. I think it does. Uh, and in a small town, you can sure identify uh, the good ones and the not so good ones pretty quick. They stand out. And, you know, and there's always in a small town, you see somebody come in that will fool some people for a while. But, uh, usually catches up with them, eventually. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, we've talked about a lot of interesting things there, a lot of good family history, and talked about Dixon. Um, what else? What, what do we forget? What, what do you want to say here? Um, I, I would say that uh, Growing up in a small rural community, the one things I did, one I thing I did learn, and which was good, gave me a, gave me a chance when I went back east in the Midwest and stuff. I had quite a large area, so I traveled quite a bit, and probably Dixon isn't much different than a similar sized town in Illinois or Ohio or Kentucky or you know when you really dissect it and. Uh, uh, you know, take it apart. So I think that growing up in a small rural community um, does give you a very good, solid uh, 
perspective of life. Um, it, it just gives you a good fun foundation. And I think that um, you you get a um, a, a, it's a good perspective. I just think it's a, a good place to grow up and a good place to raise children. And, uh, you get support in a small town. Yes, you do. And, and a lot of people think that people are nosy in a small town. I didn't. We didn't. I didn't find it that way. And you know, I find that you know, if you did something wrong, more people knew about it. Of course, until you've got. Uh, you know, that word spreads. But they're not uh, prying, I don't feel, uh, and un unless something happens where you need help, then once you need, th then they come together. Yeah, well, of course, Annette Seifer's mother worked in a switchboard with a telephone. <laughs> There's a little, a little, I won't get into that. And then, of course, the party line for the farmers. You know, yeah. There you got some, uh, some yeah. stories. Well, uh, that, yes. Yeah. And, and you, so, yes, that, that, that's true. Gossip, it does travel pretty quick, but, uh, but sometimes it's good. That's true. Keeps people honest. Well, keeps people honest, and, but if somebody gets in trouble. That's true. There's somebody to respond, or they know. Uh, we used to have an answering service here in town. A lot of the farmers, and we had it in, in this agency for a, with two ray radios. And this lady was probably one of the biggest gossips in town. But if you needed somebody, you needed to find. She knew where they were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean. Now we have cell phones and pagers and that type of thing. Well, she was our, she was like our pager. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so in, in, a, in a way, it, it, it is good, you know. But you're right, I think in, in one way it does make you, uh, it, it makes you toe the line. I mean, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do something, I know that's not right, or I know that's wrong. And if I'm in an area that I think I can get away with it, a person is more apt to do it. In a small town, somebody's going to know about it. They're going to. I mean, it's just you know. Yeah. So. It's uh, that, that was, that's one of the things growing up in a small town. Uh, you, you know, like I say, young boys stretch things, and in my early years, it was always amazing that uh, uh, God, how did my folks find out I did that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, oh, even today, you know, I felt. Talk to about over 20 people now, and and a lot of times I'll I'll talk to someone and they say, oh yeah, you're the guy. You talked to you talked to Zinette. Mm -hmm. You, you talked to Le you know Lena. You talked, yeah. <laughs> yeah no. I think there's a small town within this larger town. There's 14,000 now in Dixon. Yes, I'll, I I think there is. But even in metro areas, you you get that's true, very true. Same uh, thing. My own experience. Right. Yeah, yeah, if you grow up in a metro area, the your neighborhood. You have your neighborhood. And the old families in the neighborhood. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the, you know, kind of a, like a small town atmosphere in that. Mm -hmm. You just got a lot more people around you. Mm -hmm. uh, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, especially in the early uh, 20s and 30s and that, you had your ethnic neighborhood. Yeah, well, uh, 
Are we done here? Uh, I took up more than an hour, and I thought it was only going to take an hour. Okay, well, okay. let me turn this machine off, but uh, before I do, I just want to say thanks for uh, stopping and your busy day and, and talking to us. And thanks on behalf of Dixon and Dixon Library. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. <laughs>